Hello, this is testing day and we are going to talk today about Linux containers with Stefan Graver, one of the developers and technical lead of Lexi, Lexi, LexD, so it will be pretty fun today. Uh, but first, let's start with introductions and as usual, here's Kyle with me. So I'm, I'm Kyle Fazari. I work on the Snapcraft team. So most of my work surrounds that and uh, the Snap developer experience. Stefan, you want to go? Sure. So yeah, as was mentioned, I'm the um, LXC and LXD um, project leader and technical lead at Canonical for, for those two projects as well. OK, I'm Leo Arias. I work on quality on Ubuntu. And the purpose of testing days is just to have a relaxed chat with, uh, with a developer of some cool free software project and figure out how we can contribute to that project and how can we use that project to help during our testing and during our own projects. And Lexi is just perfect for that. Uh, with Linux containers, we can just uh, get any image of a Linux distribution out there and use it as uh, as a box, as a contained box to try whatever we want. Then we throw it away and then we start again. In a previous session, we talked about uh, using KVM virtual machines. So this is similar, but a lot light, a lot more lightweight, a lot more fast. So uh, we have been doing this every Friday since I have memory. If you want to go back uh, and take a look at the previous sessions, go to youtube.com slash Ubuntu on air. And your memory doesn't include that huge Christmas break we took. No, <laughs> I, I just remember up to January. No, right. So uh, if you are watching this, um, UbuntuOnAir.com. There's a chat box in there. Uh, just ask your, your questions, and we will interrupt Stefan to pass the questions to him. Uh, feel free to ask anything at any time. And if you are watching this, Costa Rican internet. Well, so. I'm not quite sure what exactly he was about to say there. He'll be back here in a minute. But uh, Stefan, I know you've you've prepared some slides here to, to sort of explain, you know, what. Well, actually, my first question is, uh, how do you pronounce this? <laughs> so uh, it's called. We pronounce it LexD uh, for for the LexD project itself. Uh, the command line tool is called Lexi, and somewhat confusingly, when we refer to the uh, old project, uh, we call it LXC. <laughs> so you actually, when you when you say it, you spell it out, LX, LXC. Yeah, so we, we, always, yeah, we always spell it LXD or LXC. Um, when you refer to the like, pre-LXD world with the old command line tools and stuff, we still refer to that as LXC, because that's what everyone called it. But when you refer to LXD, we, uh, to LXD, we call it LXD. Um, and the command line tool, which is also spelled LXC, we call it it Lexi. <laughs> okay. It is somewhat confusing. But usually, you only have to deal with one of the two worlds, not with both of them at the same time. So you yeah, just yeah. pick one of the two pronunciation, and you're, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leo, you cut out there for a little bit. You were you were saying if you're watching this, something. I wasn't quite sure where you were. Going. I, I man, this this sucks. I said a lot more things after that. <laughs> so, I was saying. If you are watching this on UbuntuOnAir.com, there's a chat box in there where you can send your questions and we can pass them to, to Stefan. Uh, and if you are watching this offline afterwards, you can also join rocket.ubuntu.com where we are usually hanging around. Also, feel free to, to send your questions in there. I think that was what I was saying. That Let's start. Uh, Stefan, do you want to show us something about Lexi? Sure. Um, so I'm going to start with just like a basic intro of what uh, Lexi is about. 
and then uh, do a bunch of uh, of demos as well. So let's see if I can actually awesome. share those things. Let's see, that is and share. Okay, is that working? Good. Yeah, cool. Make sure you select All right. it there. All righty. Um, cool. So first of all, quickly, what Legacy is about. Um, so our goal is really to use container technology to create an environment that looks and feels exactly like a virtual machine, but using containers rather than virtualization extension. That means like much lower overhead, it's faster and everything. Um, but for our end user, we don't want them to have to really think through things and having to repack all of the applications and whatnot. We just want them to be able to use um, the exact same workflow that they would, are used to for physical machines and for virtual machines, but use containers instead. Um, so for those who have been using um, LXE before, so the old LXE user experience with LXE dash create and all of that stuff, um, LXT is really a step up from that. Uh, we've completely reworked the command line experience to be much, much user friendly um, compared to that. And also LXT is designed from the start to be available for the network. So you've got a simple REST API that exposes your containers, images, and everything. So you can script it pretty easily if you want to. Uh, we do have some clients that comes with the code base directly, but you can write your own pretty easily. Um, and the, the reason yeah. behind the LXD started in drug, was that was that really for OpenStack? Um, not really. It, it was. And so with LXC, uh, we had like a lot of of baggage. Like we, we didn't want to ever break someone an upgrade. So we couldn't really make use of new features mm -hmm. uh, offered by the kernel so easily because those features would break a lot of existing workloads. Same thing with the command line experience. So many people, including the early Docker, who are scripting around our command line tools that we couldn't ever rename any of them or other new, new command line option because we would break everyone. Uh, so we couldn't make the user experience any better because so that would break every one of our power users. Um, so switching to a new project was like a nice way of clean slate. We're still using the same underlying um, library and everything, but it's it gets us like a completely clean user experience. Um, so as I mentioned, it's way faster than vectorization. Uh, there's basically no overhead. Um, we typically compare LXD performance as um, with fit, with physical machines as opposed to comparing with virtual machines. Um, one of the things I just mentioned is that we Part of the, the stuff we couldn't change in all LXC was uh, security. Back when LXC was started, there was effectively no security around much uh, because it was the first kernel implementation of containers. There wasn't any user namespacing. Um, and you were root in a container, you could escape it trivially. It wasn't really the intent to give unprivileged user access um, to a container and let them do whatever they want as root inside that container and not break your machine. Um, no, no app armor or anything. So yeah, app armor was kind of there, but you can bypass it pretty easily if you've got root in the container. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We most like like of the features we're really making a lot of use in um, with LexD. It's mostly um, the unprivileged container. So using a user namespace mapping, uh, that's something that only ex we introduced in the 3.12 kernels. It's only been around uh, four years, or not even three years-ish. Um, and we, I mean, LXC was, LXC supported all of those features, but you had to actually configure your containers to use them. Um, and it wasn't used by default. So yeah, we wasn't the best user experience, really. Um, now with... Um, So with FlexD, we default to having like a perfectly safe um, setup where we use username spaces, we use uh, capabilities, we use uh, SecComp, we use Apama, we use just about everything we can get hands on uh, to make the container as safe as possible. You can still opt out of those if you want to, uh, but the default is to be safe. Um, as, far is, as, as far as SecComp goes, what is, a, mm -hmm. what is a reasonable default for you then? Well, so SecComp, we just use it as default blacklist. Like we turn, we drop a bunch of uh, really harmful syscalls that if you were allowed to ever use those, we would be 
that would be a big problem. Okay. Uh, in unprivileged containers, we don't really need to drop anything. In privileged containers, we do drop a bunch of syscalls that would let you uh, go through a bind mount and reach the host file system, for example, uh, or okay. you know, load kernel modules, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so it's really just the list of syscalls that would allow you to break out, essentially. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so we, we use that for privileged containers. For unprivileged containers, we do apply a, sys a sec comp policy, uh, but it's mostly a safety net in case the kernel user namespace protections don't uh, block the container, which okay. they should. But if there's a security issue in that code, then maybe the sec comp code Multiple won't Multiple layers, have. right? Yeah. Exactly. Could you, um, could you please talk a little about privileged and unprivileged? What's the difference in there? Yeah, so I mean, Typically, the main difference between privileged and privileged containers is just whether root in the container is root on the host. Um, so default LXC and LXD, if you tell it to run the container as privileged, uh, UID 0 in the container will be UID 0 on the host, which means that if you can get your hands on any file system entry coming from the host, or you can get or you can somehow escape the container, you will have full root privileges on the host. Uh, and there are several ways to escape such a container right now um, that can't really be fixed because there are basically design mistakes in the kernel, and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, in unprivileged containers, your user will you'll see UID 0 in the container. So you will see that your root in the container, but you're in fact going to be UID 100,000 or something outside the container. So should you be able to escape or get your hands on the file system descriptor from the host, you'll have as much right as a nobody user. Okay, so what kind of uses would require privilege? Um, so you will need privilege if you need to create um, raw devices, if you want to mount some block devices, if you want to you know, configure loop devices, that kind of stuff, um, because those are kind of inter interfaces that require root access. Um, those are the, the usual ones that people come up. Uh, come to us with uh, saying like they have some block device they want to pass inside the container and have the container partition it and mount it. If you want to do that, then you basically need to be privileged. Um, there are some way around it. You can fuse file systems work fine in unprivileged containers. Um, the Ubuntu kernel has a patch that allows uh, X4 from for, to be mounted inside an unprivileged container if you turn an option on. Um, but yeah, those kind of code paths are pretty risky, and we don't expect them to really be allowed in unprivileged containers anytime soon, because they effectively mean um, giving a random user an ability to dr to dump uh, binary code directly in the kernel and have it pass it, um, which is you know what the file system does. It, it reads the super block of, of the block device and passes it, and then does stuff from that. But if the user can alter that block device as the kernel is reading it, then you can reasonably easily find a, a code path in the kernel to let you attack the kernel itself, and then you're kind of screwed. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. I, I, I love that you came. It's all the questions I always wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So yeah, never give uh, root access inside a privileged container to someone you don't trust with root access on your host, because they effectively get that. No matter how many layers of SecComp and Apama you stack on that, they will be able to escape somehow. Um, there, there are a bunch of really weird uh, syscalls that you kind of need that also let you do some pretty evil stuff in the kernel, unfortunately. All right. Um, so you just want to show like a, you know, um, kind of normal deployment for someone that uses LexD on more than one machine. Um, so you'd get a bunch of different physical machines. They all run a Linux kernel. They all run. Um, LibLXC, which uh, we use to actually drive the kernel APIs to create containers. Then LexD sits on top of that uh, through the GoLXC binding. And that's the daemon that then offers a REST API. And we've got some clients that can talk to that REST API. Um, the demo I'll do later will be using our command line LXC client, uh, well, LXC client. Um, and that, that tool talks over the REST API. Uh, there's basically, basically no other API in LexD. So whether you talk locally to your own LexD or remotely, you use the exact same API. It's just whether you do it over HTTPS or you do it over Unix socket. Um, we also have another client called Nova LexD, which is a component for OpenStack that lets you run containers exactly like you would run virtual machines. Um, basically, the way it ends up working is uh, if an image in 
OpenStack is marked as being for a container, then when a user spawns that image, uh, it, they will get a container. If the image is marked as running a virtual machine, they'll get a virtual machine. If you don't have any virtual machine hosts, then you can't start that image. If you don't have any container host, then you can start a container image. It's basically that simple. Uh, the user doesn't isn't even told that they're using a container. Um, as far as OpenStack is telling them, they just got the machine with an ID. Um, and the rest just happens internally. Um, so briefly on what LixD is, and because there's always a bit of confusion there. As I mentioned earlier, we're not virtualization technology. We do not use virtualization extension in any way whatsoever. Um, we're entirely using containers. And then we offer VM-like semantics on top of containers. Um, we are not a fork of, of good old LXC. Um, as I mentioned, we're actually based on top of the libLXC library. Uh, we just don't use any of the command line tools and have LexD instead as its own set of command line tools and APIs. And last one is also like where a lot of confusion tends, tends to be at. Um, we're not an application container manager. So application container managers would be Rocket, Docker, RunC, those kind of things. Those require uh, very specific images that you know typically will run a single process or just a single task they're reasonably stateless usually um, you upgrade those by throwing container away and cleaning it again uh, you don't typically get like ssh access inside your container you don't run apt or snap to install and update your packages in there you don't really do configuration um, yourself you don't use a configuration manager inside them etc like it, it's really an app effectively that you that you run, and when that container dies, the app gets respawned, and that's it. Um, yeah, it's really, it, you're, yeah, it's not, it's a move from like the, you know, baby this machine to to having something that's that's scalable and disposable, right? Is that right, yeah, yeah. And, and and there's a lot of interest, there's definitely a lot of uh, good reasons to use Docker, Rocket, etc. If you have designed your infrastructure to be microservice based, and you can spawn uh, as many of each of the components as you want, and they all talk to each other, and most of them are stateless, and you just use like an external service for your data. data. It's great, it's fine. Um, but turns out a lot of people don't aren't quite there yet, uh, and they would much rather just get a normal clean distro that gets normal security updates and stuff uh, from their distro, and then deploy their software in there. Which doesn't prevent you from running Docker inside LexD, I and mean, we, we we do support that to some extent. Uh, you can run a Docker container for a couple of services that work best as Docker containers because they're upstream publish Docker images that they test and everything. And for everything else, you just run it on the side inside the LexD container. It's perfectly fine. For for us doing exploratory testing on a Snap or or whatever project. Lexi is, is much better because it's a closer environment to what you would get on a real machine. But still, it's it's a lot safer, and it's a lot more lightweight, and a lot faster, and you can throw it away easily. So I, I this, this changed the way I work. It's great work. Thank you. Yeah, the, the part where, like, the, the throwaway part is something that people quite enjoyed because it Nobody really like nobody who's doing development really enjoys having like thousands of development packages and stuff installed on their machine. Um, it's you usually want to keep your machine as clean as possible and just you know deploy your whatever you're working on inside a contained environment that is going to run as close to the production environment as possible. And Lexi lets you do that. You can run uh, Ubuntu Zesty, so development release on your laptop, and run Ubuntu 16.04 LTS containers uh, that match your production environment. And you do the development using that. It's perfectly fine. Same thing. Like If you need to deploy on CentOS, but you're not such a big fan of running um, a Red Hat-based system on your, on your machine, that's perfectly fine, too. You can just use install LexD on any other distro and just run your CentOS container. Um, so we, we touched on that earlier, um, the dual container safety. Um, so as I mentioned, we are using user namespaces by default. That's what gets you in privileged container. Uh, we do use military access control. So that's AppArmor and SecComp uh, that we really configure by default. Uh, the underlying libLXC does support SELinux, um, but we don't have like any uh, particular 
a Linux policy being generated at the LXT level yet, mostly because we didn't get any contribution for that. If someone really cares about SC Linux confined containers on distros that have SC Linux enabled by default, then we, we can totally add um, an extra plugin to LXT for that. Do you find less people use that, obviously? Use what? We use LXT on a distro that is SC Linux based. Yeah, we don't see that so often. Um, but we do have a few, we do have users who run LXT on um, CentOS 7, Red Hat Enterprise 7, those kind of distros. Um, I mean, there are also people who run on Arch Linux and then they don't actually get anything because oh, right, there's yeah. no okay, access control whatsoever in the enabling that camera. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, okay. it works. It will degrade nicely. Like if you don't have a farmer, we just won't use it. Um, which for nice. unprivileged containers is not a huge deal because we don't rely on a farmer so much for unprivileged containers. We mostly rely on the kernel and security mechanism itself. But for privileged containers, if you don't have a farmer, it's trivial to escape. Um, I mean, we don't consider our privileged containers to be what we call root safe because we can escape them if we want to, but we won't accidentally escape them. Whereas if you don't have a PAMO enabled, you might very well just accidentally escape your container. Um, like you just runs, like you modify some proxies kind of file and oh, you just run a command on the host. Um, yeah, that kind of thing. It's it's not so great. So that's that's why for people running privileged containers, they should really make sure to have um, mm -hmm. a Palmer or a Cinex setup because otherwise it's <laughs> and it's better than a true root, but not by much. Um, we do have resource restriction. I'm gonna show some of that a bit later. But we just like virtual machines, you can limit CPU, memory, um, I/O throughputs to network and disks, um, disk usage. Uh, number of processes and a bunch of other nodes that we expose. Uh, those are interesting mostly because you can change all of them live, including uh, reducing them, which you can't usually do with virtual machine. Uh, so you can totally just look at your container's memory usage, like, well, just using like, you know, 30 megs. Well, let's set a cap at 64. And that's perfectly fine. You can then bump it to two gigs if you need to, and then turn it back down to 64. Um, Something the, I use quite often, yeah. building building a snap, and I find it's using it like ninety percent of every single core. <laughs> yeah, so the CPU limit works pretty well too, right? Yep. You can just say you just want it to use up to one CPU or two CPUs, and, and you're done. Uh, you can even go further in the sense that you can say uh, you've got like pretty fine grid scheduler uh, control if you want to. You can say that the container is al allowed to use ten milliseconds up every 50 milliseconds share of uh, CPU time. Well, and even like you can use core one, three, and <laughs> yeah. Four. Yeah, so you can pin on specific <laughs> cores, uh, or you can give a specific CPU budget, which is like a time budget, uh, or you can just give like a percentage of CPU, which would only apply if under load. Um, so we, we have a bunch of options for yeah, CPU. Yeah, really flexible, so, I like really that. Nice. Yeah. Um, and lastly, like uh, Lexi itself is designed to be pretty safe. Uh, we only use very modern TLS ciphers for all of our HTTPS stuff. Uh, because we typically control both the server and the client side, we don't care so much about legacy uh, ciphers. So we only have latest um, and greatest and everything else, we just we don't care. Um, I think we did have to enable one that we didn't really care so much about originally, just because someone, there, there are like a few uh, web-based Kind of control panels for for Lex, for LexD, and those are written like entirely in JavaScript and just talk to LexD from the web browser itself uh, over the LexD REST API, and that meant that some user you're, you're actually limited to what the browser supports. Yes, and we and <laughs> which always as, sucks. As, as, as I first works worked perfectly well for just about every browser, but I think we had an issue with like Internet Explorer 11 or something that needed something slightly different, uh, so we had to enable the cipher for that. But it was still. A, safe one. It wasn't something like really bad that you wouldn't <laughs> that want to enable. It wasn't one of the MD5 ciphers or, um, <laughs> or any of that kind of craziness that you might have to enable if you wanted to support, you know, like IE6 on Windows XP or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, boy, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Um, so on the API side of things, um, that's kind of what it looks like nowadays. So the, the rest, like the rest API lets you control, um, like, control containers and create and create snapshots on them. Um, 
all containers are created from an, an image, and we can have aliases that point to an image to make it a bit friendlier for people who don't like typing a SHA-256 hash. Uh, we have profiles, which are like a basically a collection of configuration options that you can apply to several containers at one time. So if you have a bunch of containers that are really similar, you can just create a profile that contains all the configuration options, uh, be that like resource limits, attached devices, that kind of stuff. Then you I'm just actually, apply that I'm profile to containers. That. I'm going to show exactly that for Snapcraft too yeah. after. And if you do any change to that profile, all containers that use it will be changed instantly. Like you don't need to refresh or restart or anything. Pretty much all the options just what, like that. What if you change Cloud Init specific stuff? Uh, so Cloud Init only applies on first container. Yeah, that's right. So, okay, I just wanted to yeah. double check. Yeah. yeah so the, the option is changed in that the file on disk will change on next container reboot. Future so profiles. Yeah. Cloud Init will ignore it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah Lexi doesn't really do anything fancy for for Cloud Init. We just those are user dot key, so they're just exposed to our template templating mechanism, and that's it. But as far as like you know, resource limitations, etc., those would be applied immediately. Those applied immediately, yeah. Okay. And so in the the cloud init restriction, uh, cloud init profile would also be um, available immediately to the container if they use slash dev slash lexd to query their config keys. They will see the new value. It's just a, it's just that cloud init is not a persistent daemon that monitors that. So it, it by definition runs once. Yeah, yeah. I, I got you. Um, we do support as of Lexd two point three uh, creating networks as well through the API. So you can define your bridges. You can attach uh, some specific containers or profiles to specific networks. So you can simulate like pretty complex networking. We do support uh, tunneling. So we support using the Ubuntu fan. Support using VXLAN. Support using GRE. So you can reasonably easily have a bunch of machines that run on your home network and have them all tunnel to each other using something like VXLAN. And then all your containers are actually connected on the same layer too, which can be pretty useful sometimes. We did add a new feature very recently, like less than a month ago, which is the uh, storage API that now lets you create multiple storage pools. Um, so you can have one storage pool, let's say, on using ZFS on an SSD. Then you've got another storage pool that uses BurrFS on spinning drives. And you can allocate your container on either of those as you want. And you can define new volumes that are then attached to specific paths inside the container. So you could have your database be allocated from the SSD pool, but your container itself be stored on the spindle pool. Um, but still, I think we've worked out most of the bugs with uh, that work. It took us a while because it's extremely complex. Yeah, uh, really in-depth stuff, huh? Yeah. We, we do have some corner cases we need to sort out, mostly when you attach uh, volumes to unprivileged containers because of, since volumes can be attached to more than one container, how do you deal with um, the ID map that can be different for every container? Uh, so yeah, we, we have to find, like there is a really good solution for it, but it's not merged in the upstream kernel yet. Um, and until then, we probably need to, problem. <laughs> yeah. So until then, we need to be kind of creative as to what we do. And the option will probably be whichever container you attach the volume to first will own the volume and be able to create stuff in there. And other containers well, tough luck because they are it's using a different UID map. Yeah. They see everything as being owned by minus one. And if a given path is like chmoded seven seven seven, then fine, you can go through it and do whatever you want. Um, but if it's not, it's just going to give you permission denied. And once we do get the kernel feature we want, we'll be able to, even if containers use different maps, uh, have that path show us, show properly in both of them by basic, basic having the kernel remap all accesses as needed. It, it just sort of on the fly, like as you write, then. Or, yeah. It, or, it, and, so it, assuming you know, you're accessing from one direction, it'll look a certain way. and. This yeah, way so we, we could have it like stored in one with one map on the host, and then have that remapped to the individual map of both containers, and they both see it as in their own map. So like, if they show on something to UID one hundred, it's gonna be mm -hmm. uh, one well UID one hundred in that one container would actually be like UID one hundred thousand and then one hundred on the host, but it's stored as UID one hundred on the file system on the host, and it shows up as UID one hundred in the other container, even though its actual kernel map would be for UID uh, 200,100. And something that's not, like that, that won't need to be implemented at like profile system level. That's something that's a little bit higher. No, it would it would effectively work like uh, Novale. Um, so you okay. would 
that particular path mounted in that namespace. And by the way, that's the map that you need to apply for any access to it. Okay. Um, that's going to make things much, much nicer. Yeah, because then nice. we can, you know, like sharing your home directory with the container, that kind of thing. That's just going to well, make it. Yeah, simple. well, that means yeah. you don't need to modify what Etsy sub, sub GID to actually make this all work. Is that right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and right now, you only so right now, if you want to pass your home directory and have it work, you need so you need to do that change to its ID, sub GID. You need to change your profile to have an ID map that basically passes your um, user's UID and GID straight into the container. Um, but that also means that only that that user actually has access to your UID. So if the use if the if you somehow escape that container, that container will be able to run stuff as you. Yeah, that sucks. Okay. Um, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, whereas if we have that mapping feature in the account, then you don't actually, they don't have access to your UID. If they escape, they still don't have any kind of access. Mm -hmm. do, do you, uh, are you actually the one doing that work, or, or is that happening? No, uh, currently, it's mostly driven by James Bottomley at IBM. Uh, but okay. it's been going on for like a year and a half as most kind of features kind of are. Um, so we'll be taking a really close look at it next cycle because we're at the point where we need it. So we might try and get some kind of resources on our side to help getting that stuff merged. Or Sweet. if it's really not looking like it's going to be merged anytime soon in the upstream kernel, we might do like a tiny fuse implementation of the concept and just use mm -hmm. that for now. It would kind of suck performance wise, but it would still be better than not having access at all. So. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Cool. Uh, it's a, that's good with the actual interesting part of the middle of the slides. Let's try and... Hey, that was interesting. <laughs> uh, oh, somehow my webcam is not starting again. That's interesting. Anyway, uh, doesn't feel need. Don't feel need because I'm just gonna share a terminal anyways. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Anyway. You okay. blow it up. Blow it up just a tad. Oh yeah, good round. Uh, let's do it. Huh? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm just gonna. I've got a few machines that I can use for. You know, it's just gonna connect to one of them. So. So the first one is like a stock, you know, Ubuntu 16.04 systems. Um, this is. Uh, that's a server installation. So it actually comes with Lexi pre-installed, and that's the LTS branch of Lexi. So something that's maybe worth mentioning, we do maintain two branches of Lexi. We've got a feature branch that releases at least once a month. Uh, we're currently at 2.11 in that branch. And we've got the stable LTS branch, which is Lexi 2.0. So we've been doing bug fix releases 2.0.1, 2.0.2, and we're at 2.09 right now. Um, the LTS branch does not see any new feature uh, Backported, it only gets bug fixes and security updates, and usually gets a new release every two months or so. So that system do being, the, do the development releases do you SRU them or are they? No, uh, development releases only land in development stories, but they are available as backports uh, in both oh, in your backports okay. and in uh, Yakati backports, and that's what's available as the snap as well, which I'll show in a tiny bit. So um, that's a. Lexi 209 stock install on servers. So the first thing you always have to do with Lexi is run Lexi in it, um, which takes a little bit the first time because it needs to generate the certificate and everything. Lexi itself is socket activated to avoid um, having to take, like, uh, well, to avoid taking resources on machines that don't use it when it's pre-installed. Um, and then just ask you a bunch of questions. This system does not have ZFS setup, so it just just lets me use that plain old directory as storage. Then you can ask, then it asks whether you want to expose it over the network or not. Um, well, let's say yes. Uh, find all addresses on default port. Um, let's just say demo as a password. There you go. And then configure networking. If you don't, your container doesn't have network, and that kind of sucks. So let's do that. Um, which just gets you through a bunch of questions. Hitting enter is usually fine. Oh, that's so, nice. Last time I did this, the, the, uh, the network. I had to do the network myself or something. Is that yeah? I think really so that was the that must have been really old. Like when we landed it, we did not have defaults. Uh, now we do have uh, defaults, but I mean those are like machine specific defaults. We look at what our new is that that kind of stuff to. to get that thing. Later, you're... Sorry, I made it. 
Yeah, he's really. Uh, <laughs> um, so to launch a container, you will do use Lexi launch. Um, so Lexi launch Ubuntu 16.04, for example, it's called that Zen. Now we're generating a client certificate uh, for the, the client tool itself. There you go. Now it talks, it's talking to the Lexi API and starts downloading reasonably quickly. There you go. So at this point, it's just storing the image and packing it. And we should have a container starting. It's slightly smaller, just so it makes it actually fit in the screen. Oh, it doesn't fit anymore. There you go. <laughs> Still doesn't. <laughs> it does. There you go. IPv6 addresses take a lot of space. Um, yeah, boy, no kidding. <laughs> so your container is now running. Um, zoom back up. Uh, you can get details on the container of Alexi Info. Um, so you see that that one container is currently running. What's its um, PID on the host? Which let's just do something interesting. You can look at that PID, and you'd see that, as I mentioned, we do use introduced containers by default. So it's mapped to uh, UID zero in that container. It's mapped to UID 100,000 on the host in this case. Um, you can see how much memory uh, the container is using. So right now it's using 20, 27 megs. Try to make an Ubuntu virtual machine using that much memory, good luck. Um, and it's peaked at 150 at setup time. Uh, you can get a shell inside that container um, by just doing an hash, then you get a shell inside it, and you can see that it's running Spock Ubuntu. Uh, we can play with resource limit a bit for now. Uh, so if I look at free, I can see the whole amount of memory that that particular host has, which is five gigs. I can set memory, oops, limits memory to gigabyte. I go back in the container, we're down to two gigs. Um, oops, can do the same thing with CPU. So CPU info should show eight CPUs on that one. So it's UID zero, um, CPU ID zero to seven. Um, so by default, does it set swap to be the amount of RAM you have in your machine as well? Um, so yeah, you, you can always see the, the amount of swap that the machine has. Um, the whether you use swap or not can be controlled. So you can okay. do. Um, okay, memory. so you, you're actually seeing host swap there. That's not doing. Yeah, you are. Okay, okay, okay. That makes more but sense. But if you can tweak whether you use it or not, so you can do limits memory swap force, and that's gonna prevent the container from using swap. Um, and the quota you set is always memory plus swap. Okay. So. If you said two gigs, it's going to be able to use. It might end up using 1.5 gig of uh, memory and 500 and 500 megs of swap, uh, unless you do what I just did, which turns off swapping. Um, but you can also turn on swapping and then say that I really don't care about this container. Uh, whoops, not memory uh, swap priority, um, and that means that it's going to be the first thing to be swapped on your machine. Ah, interesting. Okay. So containers you don't care so much about that, that might use a lot of memory. That's pretty interesting to do. Um, right, so many options. Yeah, so CPUs, uh, if I just say it, I want two CPUs. And I go back in there. Uh, just okay, So we see I've got two CPUs now. Um, LexD, if you do that, LexD will pick uh, two CPUs out of all of the ones you've got and pin you on those. It will pick whichever, whichever it thinks are least used. So it's usually ignoring anything that you're doing on the host. But it will, uh, if you've got like four containers and eight CPUs, it's going to put um, two, it's going to use two different CPUs for each container. Um, but as was mentioned earlier, you can be pretty specific. So if you want to use CPU ID 3, um, CPU, oops, and CPU ID 5 and 6, you can do something like that. And then you get your three CPUs, and it's pinned to specific CPU cores. Very um, nice. You can also get, uh, let's just do, what can I use? Uh, use my usual test farm. Okay. Uh, wait. Seriously? Come on, go faster. Don't wait a minute and a half. So I, I I had a question about the need, but then I moved the mouse and my microphone came flying. So is is there an option to get all the defaults like let's say need and don't ask me anything, just say yes. Uh, so you, uh, not really. Um, mostly because we don't wa we want the user to actually look at what they're doing when they configure the network, so that they don't accidentally break the network. 
Um, so we've tried take, take to take a subnet it. that's actually being used elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But for storage, uh, at least there are a bunch of command line options you can pass to LexDNet to avoid that. And we do have a plan to allow LexDNet reading from a YAML file, so you could like pre-write um, your host configuration and just use that. Um, but yeah, it's we don't we were considering just doing everything right by default kind of thing, but it's it's tricky because we've been doing that in the past with LXC and we've had, you know, it's one percent of Ubuntu users don't have networking working because of the LXC bridge, but it turns out that's a lot of users when you've got several hundred millions. <laughs> okay, so now it's working fine. So I can download really, really quickly, um, thanks to my action find proxy. And let's just so that's a case where the network itself is defined in the profile. So I can do, I can edit the profile. There's another way of changing variables. You can just use the text editor if you want. And I can do limits uh, ingress. And let's say I want, um, let's get a maybe to do the trick. Okay. Um, there we go. So now if I go back, Back up at 10 megabit. Um, ah, nice. So to show you that limits are changed live, I'm just going to get, oops, a second thread on that container, on that machine. And now what I'm going to do is, let's see, profile set default th0 limits ingress 100 megabit. Um, okay. Oh, uh, let's see profile device set. There. Okay. And we're going to see the speed go up to 100 megabits, and then it finishes. <laughs> now, is there. Uh, no, no, never mind. I forgot my question. So that's pretty. Like, all of our resource limits apply live like that, which is kind of convenient. Um, right. Okay. Is there is there a way for you to you know how you with the with the CPU limits you can say use a certain percentage but only on, under load? Is there a similar way to do that with the network? Uh, so the network and uh, disk IOs have a uh, priority uh, option at the container level. So you can do let's see config set uh, then that would be limits. I'm trying to remember because I don't really use it very often. Oh, oops, I'm in the container. <laughs> so it was trying to do nesting. <laughs> oh, boy, that would, that would have broken. Huh? <laughs> OK, so let's see config set then limits priority 10. That means that the container has the highest priority now when it comes to uh, network IOPS. Or if you don't care about it, you can set to 0. Uh, so you can go for um, for storage. Can you remember if we call it storage or block? We'll see. Nope, not storage. Block. Block. I'm confused. Uh, what did we call it? <laughs> no, that's OK. The, the fact that it's possible is really what my question was. I think Google will help us from there. Yeah, it is totally possible. We do have like generic priority options uh, for some of the resources. For not. Uh, CPU also has that. So you can do, for CPU, you can do CPU priority 0. And then if you're under load, that container is going to have the least lowest priority. Oh, and for uh, the block stuff, it's actually a disk, which makes sense. But it's And that's 0 to 10, you were saying? Then zero would be lowest, ten would be highest. Um, okay, cool. Okay, so that was like, the, um, as it comes with uh, with Ubuntu sixteen oh four using the LTS branch. Um, so it doesn't have any of the new features. Also, I'm using uh, a directory backend here, so that means it's going to be incredibly slow if I want to do snapshots or any of that stuff, uh, which is what I'm not going to do the demo of snapshots right now. Um, <laughs> Because it, it, a snapshot would effectively async the old container outside, which is you know, kind of slow. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll disconnect from that machine and get the shell on another one. Whereas if you were using a, a, a different a different file system, the snapshots would be using the file system right. version of so, that. Yeah, okay. yeah, the other machine is also an Ubuntu 16.04 system, exactly same setup as the other one I just showed earlier. Uh, on this one, I'm going to remove the the default uh, LexD and LexD client. There we go. And I'm going to install the LexD snap instead. Uh, 
All right. So that's installing uh, LexD 2.8 right now. And from the stable channel, we do have LexD 2.11 in the candidate channel that we'll be releasing probably later today. I don't think anyone complained about anything being broken. So uh, we'll be switching are, over to it. This are, you making, are you making daily releases to Edge? Or only uh, so yes, Edge, uh, we've got per commit uh, revisions in Edge. So our uh, Edge is probably at like 2,000 or something. Uh, close enough. <laughs> It's at revisions uh, six, uh, 1,645 right now. Um, so yeah, Edge is every time we commit something to master, you get a new Edge build. Um, OK, so if somebody wants to help you testing the newest release, they can just do sudo snap install lexd dash dash edge, yep, and it will and be. Yeah, the Edge build. The, the one thing to be careful about is that you will never be able to downgrade from Edge to stable because Edge will typically have new database schemas. Uh, and as soon as you've done the database schema transition, there's no going back. So you can't switch between stable and Edge to just test if a fix works, because chances are that's going to upgrade your database in a one way. Um, is that is that in snap data? Is that, or I mean, like, can you reset out of that? Uh, you, or revert is, or whatever the command is? You can't, because the problem is that it might also be then tied to container file system properties and a bunch of other things. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so if it's a new feature, like one thing we landed, for example, now if you upgrade to 2.11, there is no going back to 2.8 because 2.11 um, is the new storage API and will reconfigure all of your storage and move all your file system around. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> and obviously, your containers are not stored in the current directory because you don't want to snapshot all of your containers every time you do an upgrade of, so uh, of Is it in common, then? So it's in common. The database itself is yeah. stored in current. So if you revert, it will revert the database. But if we change anything on the file system, there's, you're just true. Like, there's nothing you can do around that. Um, yeah. So I've got two points. I mean, that's, as good, that's as good as you can do it, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so you've got 2.8 installed now. Uh, same process. Uh, wow. What? Oh, that's because the news. Wow, that's special. That didn't do that yesterday. <laughs> oh, no, that's because uh, I just typos. No, oh, I meant Lexi in it. That was Lexi in it without any argument. And yes, it was perfectly right. That was wrong. Uh, I just wasn't expecting to that. So yeah, Lexi in it. Um, we do bundle the ZFS tools in the snap. So as you can see, it will pre-select ZFS in that case, because the kernel supports it and the snap has the tools. So it just does ZFS by default. It will create a new storage pool for you. Um, if Unless you tell it otherwise, uh, it's just going to do a loop device. If you do have a spare partition or spare disk you can use, please use that. Like Loop devices don't offer good performance and or stability, but they're still better than nothing. Um, oh, and actually, you need, yeah. the, you need the, what, the, the removable media interface for that? Is no, no, no. Um, the the LexD interface is is. Oh, that that yeah, OK, I got you. Got you. Got you. <laughs> no, because it's, LexD needs to load kernel modules and configure kernel stuff, so we don't use your traditional snap interfaces. All right, so you see, it's a bit different. Like it didn't drop you into DeepConf or anything from the network. It's like all integrated because we use the new uh, storage API. So in two point eight, you can do LexD network list. Um, there you go. You see your. Um, Bridge is defined. Uh, you can go and see the bridge properties, which show you subnets. You can change what, whichever way you want. Um, and so if we do, now I can start my Zen container again. Um, I, tried, I tried this a few minutes ago, and I had to run uh, the Lexi commands with sudo, with root permissions. Is that a limitation on the snap? Is it different from the depth? Um, so it kind of depends on how your system is set up. Um, the way we do access control on the LXC command is we check whether you're part of the LXD group. Snaps cannot create system groups. So um, if you install on a system that's never had uh, LXD installed, then only root can talk to LXD. If you installed on a system that already had LXD installed at one point, then the LXD package would have created the group, in which case the LXD snap will use the group. Let's see, and what if I add the group? If I create the group. So after? if you do, yeah. So if you do, if you do add group, uh, and you add like a, the Lexd group, and you add yourself to that group, and then you restart the Lexd snap, the the Lexd snap will then start using that group. Okay. Good to know. So yeah, you, that's you, you can definitely set that up yourself. We want to eventually have like a snap interface or something that lets us 
define system groups and do that automatically, but it's not there yet. Okay, so and right now it's done the exact same thing as before. It downloaded the image, it's putting dumping it into the image store. The main difference that this time it's creating a ZFS file system as well for the image. So the first launch was pretty slow because it had to download that image and you know and pack it and read it and everything. Oh, I can actually do that because I don't have it installed. Uh, but now if I want to start a new container, it's gonna be much quicker. Um, there you go. Because the image is already in ZFS, all it needs to do is create a new file system, so just a clone operation in ZFS. And it's well slightly slow just because it needed to remap the um, the UIDs and GIDs for the container, which needs going through the old file systems. It's somewhat slow. Um, so I've got two containers running now, which is the same thing as before, like you have JSON and everything. Um, one feature I didn't show before because it needs a more configuration uh, with the dev than it does with the snap is you can do let's see profiles. Let's do it in a different profile. So set default. But we've got that property. Um, actually, let me show you something before. So if I look at there you go. So we see in the systems running, we've got the host in the system itself running. Then we've got two of them are run, two more of them are running, and that's the container. Uh, so I've got two containers. The two of them are using the same UID uh, for the root UID. Plus, we can change that. So you can do prof default set security um, ID map isolated true. And yeah. now I, I was just about to ask the question. Yeah. So now you need to restart the two containers uh, because oh yeah, I fixed that bug in uh, two eleven. <laughs> yeah. Now, is there a reason that's not a default? Um, the reason is that it's pretty wasteful. It does use 65,000 uh, UIDs and GIDs per container. Yeah, you only have so many, I suppose, huh? Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. So you, you, even using that map, you can still use it. And the other thing it prevents is because we don't have that magic kernel feature where we can map five systems back and forth, it means you cannot share any directory between those two containers anymore. Um, OK, so the containers are back online. And now if I look, we see that one of them as UID 65,556, and the other one as UID 131,072. So they're on completely separate maps right now, and like they don't overlap or anything. Um, the other thing we can do now with that we've got ZFS uh, set up is um, you can create snapshots pretty easily. So if it's snapshots, then uh, I'll just call it now, for example. OK, snapshot is created. That's much faster than having to do an arsing of the old thing. Um, and wow. now let's just, you know, do something stupid. Uh, there you go. Container isn't going to work so well. Yeah, it's not super happy right now. Uh, and now we can restore the snapshot. And we're back to normal. Um, so you know, you will also see oh, better if it's a bit smaller than that. There you go. That, there's one snapshot for that container. If you do info on the container, you'll see the snapshot being listed. Uh, you can delete a snapshot for, by doing container slash snapshot name. Um, and because we're using a nice, smart file system, um, if you look at the disk allocation, you see the 42 gigs of um, the old ZFS volume right now. But you, because ZFS supports um, path-based quotas, you can do set one gig. Oops. There we go. So we set the uh, root device of the container. I can actually show what the container config looks like. Um, okay. So container config is made of those key values I was setting before for you know um, things like the isolated property I just set. Um, it also stores all of the image properties from the image it was created from. Um, stores the ID map that it's currently using. Uh, so that it knows when to remap, stores its last state in case the daemon crashes and needs to restart containers, stores its MAC address and device name. Um, but it's also yeah, that, that last state is super handy for ephemeral containers where I have to like hard reboot or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't post them, brings them back up. So for the device, yeah. Before we close, uh, not yet, but uh, could you show? Could you launch an Ubuntu core container and maybe yeah. install a snap in there? Like, yeah, I can do that. Um, so yeah, briefly, we've got devices. Um, so we see that network device was added when you did index DNet. And we've got the root device of the container with the quota of 10 gig I just set. 
So now if we exec into the container and we look and we see we've got a 10 gig quota applied. That's good. It's cool that it's live. That's, that's yeah. super handy. So you can similarly like resize your containers and everything whenever you want. And um, if your storage is inherited from a profile, then you can set in a profile that applies to all your containers. Um, yeah, do that with a VM. Just for kicks, we're gonna restart. I'm just gonna upgrade on the LXD. Uh, I can't, I can't type. Just gonna upgrade to LXD uh, three eleven from two eight. See what happens. Uh, that should migrate us to um, having the storage API now. But yeah, first it needs to shut down the containers and upgrade, then restart everything. So okay, All right. So it did create. It set up the, the new storage pools and imported the loop device and everything. Um, let's see. It seems to work fine. <laughs> yep. We'll continue the running again and then to just stop it. Okay. So yeah. Um, now Ubuntu go. Uh, just trying to remember if there's anything. Special I don't think so. Uh, I've never tried running Ubuntu core uh, using the legacy snap, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I didn't so actually know this was possible. I tried it a few minutes ago, and it went well for me. So okay. let's hope. <laughs> so we do publish Ubuntu core images. Um, those are published weekly because they're the base image that it generated from pretty much never changes. So um, and all updates are done through uh, SnapD inside it. Uh, we do have a bit of an issue, I think, with current SnapD uh, and uh, refreshes of container uh, of uh, snaps. So you there are like permission issues um, when you don't have. You might need to actually restart your container when you snap refresh right now. Um, that's a bit of a SnapD. And this, this, this image is remote. It's something that's pre-configured. Hmm? Images remote that you're using there. It yeah, is, yes. So we do okay. we do have a set of default remotes. Um, we do have the images remote that use that's for uh, okay. community maintained images. And then we've got the Ubuntu and Ubuntu daily remotes that pull from the official Ubuntu images. Um, the Ubuntu core image will eventually transition from images to uh, Ubuntu and Ubuntu daily, but the cloud team that manages those repositories are not quite ready to uh, have Ubuntu core be published everywhere yet. Um, yeah, so the container has been created and is supposed to be running. Yeah, it is. All right. So if I get a shell in there, uh, that's as open the core system. So you see, um, it's running. It's probably severely out of date. So we might as well uh, refresh it instead of having to wait for it to and maybe do it. Is it? And is this what you're saying? We might run into issues, or yeah. So if you snap refresh, it's fine. The problem is if you then start a new confined command or thing, um, there will be. Some uh, some permission problems because Snap D uh, assumes that the file system is mounted. Oh, wow! Currently, network sucks. Um, oh man! Yeah. <laughs> so Snap D assumes that uh, your that the root of your file system is mounted are shared, um, which means that mm. any new mount being created would automatically propagate into uh, existing processes. And that's not the case in containers. Right, it's also not the sense. case in some other distros. So it needs a bit of tweaking for that. Um, it also assumes your network is perfect, it seems. Well, it, um, not, yeah. But the second refresh was fine. <laughs> All right. So we've unloaded, what is it? Like we don't have PC kernel 45, which is not there, and 394 for the other one. But I'm pretty sure if we look, like if you look at uh, there. That's not the best crap I could have done. Um, Why is the actual session tree? It's, you know, it's pretty long and okay. There we go. Uh, that's few, oh, but we won't see because fuse is not. Uh, okay, so slash itself here is mounted currently from uh, core three nine four. Um, and what version do we do as a node? I did something more recent than that. Yeah, well, that seems. It, it's, if it's AMD sixty four, it should be like like thirteen thirty seven. Uh, it shows sixteen dash two. Is that right? Oh, but it doesn't have Snap Info yet because it's not upgraded. Okay, fine. So we we can check whether the upgrade for, by whether Snap Info exists after we boot. Uh, <laughs> 
need to wait a little bit because it needs to go through its like internal bootloader and stuff. Okay, we're back. Uh, hey, look at that. We've got snap info. Uh, Good. And we're running core 16 2 now. So revision, well, <laughs> 13, 13, 13, 13, 13, 13. Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. and now we are actually running out of time, but I only want to invite you again. Like this. <laughs> This was so one thing I can good. show really quickly is we can set the nesting property on the core container. And then we can install next the inside the core container. Because <laughs> what can possibly go wrong with that? Uh, so like how, many, how many times can you do this? That's the question. Uh, the kernel restrictions, I think by default, it's 32 levels. That can be true. Yes, you can that... wiggle the kernel if you want more than that. Um, <laughs> Well, that's probably enough is to that, get a couple things done. Yeah. So it's is like, that the challenge, Kyle? <laughs> yeah, so I did like the net. Now uh, let's take like a tiny container, like Alpine is like the tiniest image we've got of thing right now. So that it posts really quickly and container is launched. Uh, yep, there we go. Got the container running inside the container. And that's using a Ubuntu core. Um, and we could try and push the fun a bit further by. <laughs> See what happens with that. So many things to play with <laughs> on a Friday evening. You're going to get some okay. terrible bug reports. <laughs> so now open to call it starting up. Come on, get an IP. You can do it. There you go. Nice. So now I've got an open to call inside my open to call, and we can check that it's the real thing because Snap Info doesn't exist. Very nice. Okay, so one one more quick question kind of on this then. Ignoring the Ubuntu core uh, uh, image that you have there, excuse me. Can you run snaps in in the typical like like a, like the Xenial uh, images you're using? Um, yes, you can. Uh, so yeah. if I get in like one of those in your containers, you need to install Squash Fuse first um, because mm -hmm. it does not depend on it. Um, so you install Squash Fuse, then uh, I'll just go with the. Thing does the host does the host kernel need to be a yakety one or does it does no, it that work on no, no, we've we've backported okay. the feature to Zinio. It's just it, okay, it took a while for it to actually land because it's it was part of a batch set that goes reverted and re-added like three times. So it's only been done by default properly in the Zinio kernel as of early January. Okay, um, excellent. So yeah, um, hello world just works fine now. You can install Squash views and then install your snap and you're done. Um, oh, the other thing I can. And also, and I know we're running out of time, but there is um, a Snap client interface you can use if you want to integrate a Snap with the Lexi Snap. So I've got one of those, which is called the Lexi Demo Server Snap. That's basic, basically what we run on our website for people to try Lexi online. Um, so I just installed that Snap. Um, I think I actually have it in the info now uh, for the instructions that you need to do afterwards. Oh, uh, Snap info. Um, yeah, so you just need. Once it's installed, you do need to snap connect because it's, I mean, because of all the security issues we uh, security concerns we mentioned earlier, we don't auto connect to the XD interface. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can configure that thing. Um, so right now it's configured to just spawn the bash shell. Uh, what can we do? Uh, well, I guess bash is fun enough. Okay, so just let it as it is. It's gonna use a 1604 Ubuntu image. Um, Oh, and it's got some quota, so it's gonna couple of 200 processes, one CPU. Uh, let's run that to two jobs. And that's two, two CPUs, 256 megs of RAM, and okay, that's fine. All right. Um, now I just need to get another window set on the machine real quick. Uh, that was running on the throat. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Okay, I'm just gonna change the screen share real quick and show you what happens. So that snap is now installed and configured. That was really, really easy once you've got the, the Lexi snap set up. Um, and if I hit that machine over the network, uh, does that actually show? I'm still seeing your terminal. Your terminal. Yeah. Okay. So okay, not. Let's try to cancel all of that. There you go. Very. Is it still showing my terminal? Still terminal here. Yeah. That's weird because it's not showing the it's, screen. It's changing size though. It's it, it's a little. Yeah, I think Hangout is confused. Um, okay, I'm just gonna rejoin. <laughs> I 
Right, yes. He'll, he'll come back in a sec. He is turning it on and off again. <laughs> Maybe Firefox updated underneath it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Firefox is breaking all our Hangouts. It's good, though. Uh, well, anyway, we're close to closing. Do you want to say some last words? How? Well, gosh, I, I actually, I could do this for another hour. I got so many questions about this. Yeah, we, we need so, to do this again. Yeah, and I'll right. I'll show the the profile stuff uh, uh, next week. How's that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm Stefan. Yeah, I had to restart everything. Uh, okay. And my webcam is just completely dead for some reason. Anyway. Uh, let's see if screen share works. Yes, it does. OK, so uh, that's what you get if you hit uh, that machine uh, on port 8080. You get that dialog. Then you can click on, I've read the terms and stuff. Um, I see you're a Bootstrap fan. <laughs> well, it's easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and then you I get like the it. container. And you can, you, know, you can use that for any kind of project demos. You can change that bash command to any command you want. And your user will get a 30-minute session or whatever oh, time beautiful. you figure. Um, that's what we use on our website. So if you go on um, the LinuxCompiler.org website for Lexi, um, there's a Try It button here. That gets you the exact same kind of interface, um, which will also get you, come on, there you go. We get you a shell, but we'll also get you step-by-step -step instructions underneath. So like it will tell you, you know, to launch your first container, type this command. If you click on it, it runs it inside the terminal. Uh, so that's, that's a really awesome. nice way of going step by step learning how LXT works even before you install it anyway. Awesome. So try it. Go to linuxcontainers.org, find the try button, start playing with it. Also, really important is your blog, Stefan. Everything I've learned about Lexi is through your great posts. Oh, yeah, so. I do have a lot of blog posts on, on my blog. Yeah. So don't start from the last one. Start from the first one. And there, there are some. Yeah, if you go uh, on a bit, you'll see uh, that there's like a blog post series thing. If you click on that link, then it gets you there, uh, which gets you a step, but well, like a bunch of different blog posts for LXD 2.0 itself. So what you get in the LTS by default. And then you've got a bunch more posts um, for like newer LXD and things that are really related to LXD. So we've got the Ubuntu core in LXD, for example. We've got how to use the LXD client on Windows Mac OS. Uh, we've got how uh, to use LexD on Debian using the snap. We actually have a few users doing that now. So th that's a really nice way of getting LexD running on, on Debian systems. OK, great. So thanks a lot, really. And we, we definitely need to do this again, because I'm sure there are so many things to show uh, still related to LexD. But let's finish today. and. Next week we have another testing day. Uh, this time we will be we will be talking with the with a couple of people working on System seventy six. So also bring all your questions to they to them. They sell machines with Ubuntu pre-installed. So it's a pretty interesting topic to see how they do the testing. How do they certify? stuff and how do they prepare to a new release that will come soon in April. So see you next week. Thanks Kyle. Thanks. Thank you, Stefan. Stefan. Thanks so much for coming. It was Thanks. great to have you. Bye. Thanks and bye. bye.